from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, it is my great pleasure to give you Nathan Hill. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for coming. Um, I, uh, <laughs> um, I, I wrote this book for a long time. It took me 10 years uh, to write this book. Uh, and um, there were moments along the way when I would kind of daydream, you know? I would allow myself to think, what would it be like to have a book out in the world? What would it be like to be a published author? And I would, I would entertain all, all of these thoughts, but there are certain things you can't prepare for. Uh, for example, last night uh, I was standing at the Library of Congress at this festival's opening gala, which was lit up in purple like a rave in Paisley Park. Uh, and, and today I'm in front of you good people, and this is just not something I ever expected to do. So thank you so much for uh, coming out. I really, really appreciate it. Um, one of the things I did day daydream about, I'm sorry, I just have to tell this story. Um, one of the things I did day daydream about when I, was, when I was writing this book is like, well, wouldn't it be cool if one day I saw my book out in the wild? You know, like somebody out there reading it, like, like, like at a restaurant or a cafe or an airport or on the train or something. So <laughs> chalk this story up to be careful what you wish for. Um, on, the, on the trip that I took just before this one, I was flying uh, from Boston to Seattle, and I sat down in my, in my seat on my plane um, next to the two most talkative people on the airplane, just super chatty. I don't know about you, I usually kind of put on my headphones and just try to like just ignore everything, but, but that was impossible. And they were, they were so friendly, and the, you know, they sussed out very quickly who I was. Oh, you're a writer, oh really, what are you doing in Seattle? You have a book out, what's the book called, and et cetera, et cetera. And the guy next to me was just like, I'm gonna buy it right now. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so he pulls out his phone uh, and he gets into the app and he buys the book and then it downloads right before we have to, right before like we have to put it on airplane mode and we, and we take off. And so he's reading the, he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> and he starts reading my book and he reads the prologue, which is like just like a page and a half. He reads the prologue and he turns to me, he's like, all right, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, thinking, okay, he'll put the book away and he'll go on with his life. But no, then he moves on to chapter one and he starts reading chapter one. And, and it, it's clear that he is just going to keep reading while I'm sitting right next to him. And so I'm like, this is awful because like if he laughs, I'll, of course, I'll look over and be like, what is he laughing at? Or if he doesn't laugh, that sends, sends a completely different signal altogether. And so I'm like, I have to signal to this guy that it's, uh, that it's okay for him to stop reading because maybe he hates it, but he then can't put it away because I'm his neighbor now. So I, uh, so I act like I take a nap. Like for half an hour, I act like I take a nap. And then I kind of open my eyes and he's still reading. And so then I put on a movie, and I watch the whole movie, and I look over, he's still reading. He, he, he's, he's reading completely expressionless the entire, the entire flight. And so we land, and, and he looks over at me for the first time he speaks, and he says, good job, good job. <laughs> and I said, thanks. And he said, you know, a couple of times there, I almost laughed out loud. <laughs> And his wife leans over and she's like, oh, that's, that's really, that's really a, a high compliment. He never laughs out loud. <laughs> and so I was like, maybe this is a special occasion. Like, we should commemorate this. This is pretty weird, right? And so I'm like, so do you want to, like, take a selfie or something? And he's like, no, why would I do that? <laughs> anyway, bye. And then, he, and then he walks away. And that was, that was I never even got his name. So... Uh, be careful what you what, what you wish for. <laughs> Finally, um, the only other story I want to tell you about before I talk, start talking about the book is 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 um, something that I never daydreamed about that I discovered recently. There is right now for sale on Amazon an ebook called Summary of the Knicks. I don't know if you know, like when I was in high school, it was called Cliff's Notes. I think they're called spark notes now, but I discovered this recently that somebody had done this to the Knicks. Somebody had written a 44 page summary of the Knicks. And I'm like, it's not like my book is being like assigned to high schoolers. Like what, why would anybody buy a summary of the book? Um, 
and there are, there are user reviews, there are comments. And I'm going to read you a couple. <laughs> this summary of the Knicks was well written. I could read this summary again and again rather than the whole novel itself. I sometimes have a difficult time finishing a book because I can't read it all at one sitting. With this summary, I don't have that problem. <laughs> this summary makes it possible for the reader to have a cocktail party talk recognition of all the ideas presented by a new author. And that was the one when I knew I'd made it. You know, when like people, like strangers at cocktail parties, feel like they need to have read my book, but don't actually want to read it, that, that made me feel really, really special. <laughs> anyway, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Carlos, for the really wonderful introduction. I always feel bad for people who have to introduce me because then they have the burden of describing what the book is about, um, which it turns out is, is kind of a challenge. I had to do this for the first time last summer at the Book Expo America conference, which was the beginning of the whole kind of run up to publication. Um, I'd never really thought about it before. Um, you'd think that I wrote the thing, so I would be able to describe it well, but that is totally not true um, at all. I was actually scolded by a member of the, uh, of the Knopf uh, sales team for being so bad at this. I was at a restaurant and she said, all right, pitch me your book. What's your book about? Pretend I'm a stranger. What's the book about? And I was like, oh. All right, well, it's, um, it's sort of about, about like political protest and, and, and video games, but it's not really about video games. And it's also, there's some academic satire in there, and there's a mo mother-son story, and the first half of the book is sort of about the son, but the second half of the book is sort of about the mom. And if I guess I've had, I'd had to sum it up, I'd guess it's like kind of just about life, you know? And, <laughs> and this, this woman whose job it is to be good at this, she looks at me with these like daggers of living hatred, and she's like, no try again, you know. Um, this is not something they teach you about in school. Uh, how to, they, they teach you how to maybe write a book, but they don't, they don't teach you how to talk about the book without being a total bore. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's difficult describing this book. My hometown newspaper called it the, just quote, the book about everything, and left it at that. Um, uh, my favorite quote came from Entertainment Weekly, and this is how they put it. If any novel defied an elevator pitch in 2016, it was the Knicks. <laughs> Acid critique of millennial entitlement, video game addiction and clueless academia, tender meditation on childhood friendship, first loves and maternal abandonment, handy tutorial on 60s radicalism and Norwegian ghost mythology, Nathan Hill's overstuffed debut contains multitudes and then some, which I, which I thought was pretty, pretty accurate. Um, the truth is, uh, I, I didn't know I was supposed to write a book that could be neatly summarized or elevator pitched. Um, when I was writing, uh, all I wanted to do was write a book that felt to me true, that felt like it accurately represented what the world felt like uh, on my nerve endings. Um, now, I'm not a writer who, who creates an elaborate plot or an outline and, uh, and hammers away at it. For me, it's much more about creating a certain feeling, um, a certain emotional timber. Um, and the plot usually comes as, as a result of that. When I sit down to write in the morning, I don't quite know what's going to happen that day, but I know how I want it to feel, and that's a starting place. Um, so I end up constructing my plots just a little bit at a time, going where uh, the emotion is, um, and having no real idea where I'm going to um, end up. There's this quote from E.L. Doctorow that I love uh, uh, about this kind of writing. He says that writing a novel is like driving a car at night. Um, you can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Uh, and that's what ri uh, 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 writing the Knicks felt like, um, that, uh, that I could on only see so far uh, in front of me. Um, and a lot of times you're kind of operating on your gut. Uh, you have an impulse to add something, and, uh, and then you try it out, and then sometimes it feels right, and it stays. Um, so I wanted to tell you a few stories uh, about how some of the major subjects uh, covered in the novel got there, um, and uh, wanna try to answer a question that I've been getting, getting a lot uh, in the last year, which is why did you write a book about so many things? Um, so the, the primary topic uh, uh, of, the, of the book is, is, is protest. The, the, the novel covers um, two or maybe even three generations of protesters 
You have the, uh, you have the uh, protests of the 2004 Republican uh, uh, National Convention in, uh, in Manhattan, uh, the 1968 protests at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, and there's a little Occupy Wall Street in there in, uh, in one, cha uh, one chapter. This all happened because I started writing this book in 2006. Um, I had just finished school and I was moving to New York City. And now this was something I wanted to do for a very, very long time. Uh, I was a kid who grew up in the Midwest with like big dreams of like going to uh, New York City and becoming like, I don't know, like Truman Capote or something. You know, like I wanted to get invited to the, the, the cool Paris Review parties and so forth. Um, and, uh, and so this was, this was just where I was going to end up for uh, most of my life. Like, I kind of knew this. I even, I grew up in the Midwest and started, started rooting for the Yankees. Like that's how, that's how committed I was. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, and uh, so I, I finally moved to New York in 2006. I was like 20, I don't know, like 26 or so. And, uh, and it, it felt like a kind of dream come true, you know? It was what I'd been waiting to do for a, a very, very long time. Um, and my first month in the city, uh, I lived in a sublet while I was looking for a more permanent apartment. I rented this one month sublet um, in Queens. Uh, and uh, and it was, I was like sharing a house with 12 other guys who all worked on the same road construction crew. Uh, and they would come home at the end of, the, end of their, their shifts and like, change into their underwear and eat hot dogs and just play enormous amounts of Call of Duty in the living room like for the rest of the day. And this was, this was life, you know. Um, the guy I was renting the room from, from turns out, was like uh, this fanatic for B horror movies. And so like every square inch of the wall in his bedroom was covered with, with like pictures of people like screaming or bleeding or both, you know. So it was a weird place to live my first month in the city. And, uh, and so I didn't spend much time there. Um, I, was, uh, I was kind of out about in the city seeing what was, what was happening. And one of the things that happened my first month in the city, this was August 2000, uh, 2004, sorry, August 2004, um, uh, was that uh, the, the, the Republican presidential nominating convention was being held in Madison Square Garden. Um, and this was, of course, Bush Cheney's second term, uh, and uh, the war in Iraq was ongoing, uh, and so a lot of people were coming into town to protest. And so I thought, this is going to be a really uniquely New York thing to watch, so I will go see it. Um, and I did. Um, anyway, fast forward to the end of the month. I f have found a new apartment, uh, but uh, there's this awkward day where I have to be out of my sublet in the morning, but I can't move into my new apartment until the evening, so I put everything in my car, I go to work, I come back, ready to move into my new apartment, and the car is empty. Like, everything's gone. So all of my books, all of my clothes, and most, most importantly, the computer on which I had stored everything I had written in my graduate programs, like three years of writing, a book in progress, all of it was just gone all of a sudden. Um, and, and you asked me, did you back it up? And I would say, yes, um, on, I backed it up on CDs that were stored stupidly right next to the computer. So they were, stol they were stolen too. Um, um, as a side note to this story, I then sent out hundreds of flyers to the area pawn shops saying like, if you see this computer, call me, I'll buy it, no questions asked. Uh, and, uh, and like a day later, I got a phone call from a guy who ran a pawn shop. And he's like, are you the guy with the computer? I said, yes, my heart was singing, yes, I'm the guy with the computer. He says, yeah, you're never going to see that again. <laughs> I was like, why? He's like, ah, it's too old, nobody would buy it, check the dumpsters. I'm like, oh, God, you know, so it was like just twisting it a little bit. Um, and so I had, I had no writing, I had, I, had zero, I had nothing, so I had to start over. And so I kind of couldn't bear, it was just too heartbreaking to like continue working on the thing that I'd already been working on. I just, it was just too filled with negative emotion for me to like be... Uh, to, to work on it, so I was like, I'm just going to start something new. And so I decided to write about the thing that was most interesting that I'd seen recently, which was the protest at the Republican nominating convention. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but that ended up being the first words I wrote for the Knicks. Um, uh, uh, was about uh, these protests. And one of the things that one of the, like, the talking head cable news type folks were saying at the time, they were asking if, if the uh, protests in 2004 were going to get as violent uh, as the protests in Chicago in 1968. And I was really dumb. I was like, what happened in Chicago in 1968? I had no idea. Um, I've, I, I've lived in Chicago. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I've spent lots of time there. I had no idea what had happened. I was very naive. So I looked it up. And I saw that, that, that there was this ama amazing history that I, I, didn't, I was completely unaware of. And the more I looked into it, uh, uh, comparing these two protests, 68 and 2004, um, the more it 
it just, something about it hooked me. Um, uh, I, I realized that uh, I was looking at something that felt sort of familiar. Um, one journalist in, in 1968 in Chicago described it as the two tectonic plates in American political life grinding against each other on Michigan Avenue. And, and, and in some ways that, that felt like, that felt very familiar. Even in 2004, it felt like the world was getting much more, or the, the political life of the country was getting much more polarized. I, I noticed that conversations between people on different ends of the political spectrum were getting more strained and more strained. Um, and, uh, and, and so it, it's, it felt relevant. I didn't know quite what I wanted to say about it. I didn't know quite how um, uh, it would turn into a plot, but it felt it, like it burned for me for some reason. Um, and, uh, and there were two studies came out recently, I didn't know this at the time, but two st studies came out recently um, uh, about this very very subject. In, in one, there's a survey done in 1960 um, that asked American adults whether it would disturb them if their child married a member of the other political party, if it would disturb them. Uh, and in 1960, no more than 5% said yes in, in either party. Um, in 2010, they asked that, that question was asked again. And this time, 33% of Democrats and 40% of Republicans said yes, it would disturb them if their child married someone from the other political party. Um, and that was a, a bigger number than nationality, than religion, than, uh, than race. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, the, that partyism ended up being kind of the line that people drew. Um, and, and, and a more recent study showed that, uh, that, uh, that uh, they've been doing a survey of college freshmen every year for many, many years, and, and one of the questions they ask is about you know, uh, their political views, and this year's incoming freshman class um, uh, is, uh, shows the fewest number of political moderates uh, uh, that, that we've seen since 1968. Uh, so every time I, I, I would kind of look into this more, it just felt like there were, there were certain symmetries between the political moment I was living through from 2004 to the present and 1968. It just felt important to me. So I put it into the book. I didn't know quite what was going to happen with it, but I put it into the book. The other thing, on a separate, um, like, parallel track from all of this, um, I started playing video games. <laughs> you would think that those wouldn't relate at all, but um, after all of my stuff was stolen in New York, and I was quite sad, uh, and, uh, and, and things weren't quite going very well at the time. Um, uh, I, I was doing very little writing. Uh, I was sort of broke. I was, <laughs> I was working at a nonprofit poetry organization, so you can imagine what my salary was, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so a, a friend of mine, he called me, he says, uh, I want you to buy this video game. We're gonna play it together. And uh, I said, what's the game? He said, it's, a, it's called World of Warcraft. And I was like, what's that? I never heard of it. He's like, just trust me, just buy it. So I'm like, okay, so I bought it. And, uh, and we played. And he has since told me that the only reason he did that was because you can chat with the other person that you're playing with over, you know, on the game. And so he just wanted to keep an eye on me. He's a very good friend. He's very sweet. He just wanted to make sure I was okay. So we'd play the game every night. Uh, and, uh, and we would talk. Um, and, uh, and this went on for about six to eight months before he finally got sick of it. He's like, no, I can't play this anymore. And so he quit. But I just kept going. Like, I, <laughs> I had never really been a gamer before in my life. Like, I, I, like, donated one summer when I was maybe in fourth grade to beating The Legend of Zelda. And other than that, I've never really played. But I played just the crap out of World of Warcraft. Um, and um, and if, you, if you don't know anything about it, it's really embarrassing for me to talk about it now, uh, but, but um, if you don't know anything about it, it's like imagine like Lord of, Lord, of the, uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, like elves and dragons and that kind of stuff, but with like millions of people playing simultaneously. Um, and I played it so much that even after I left New York after a couple of years, I kept playing um, and I would ultimately, I would like cancel social engagements because I had to go raid with my guild, you know? Um, <laughs> And I got, really, I got really good at it, uh, really good at it. And it's a complicated game. And when you get really good at it, you feel, you feel, you feel good about that. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't think I would describe it at the time this way, but, but now I do, which is that it was in some ways emotionally analgesic. It was kind of a, it was, a, it was my painkiller, you know? Like nothing else was going very well, but at least I could come home at the end of the day and fire up this thing and get on board with a bunch of other people who we all respected each other for being good at this thing. And it was really important to be good at this thing when everything else was going poorly. Um, and it was also a, an effective distraction from kind of the real world for a little while. But then fast forward three or four years and I realized uh, I, I absolutely could not be distracted from the real world anymore. I was spending way too much time in this digital world and so I had to abandon it. And I quit kind of cold turkey and haven't, haven't played since. But 
there's something about it, about that kind of love-hate relationship I had with the game. Um, I, 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 had appre I appreciated how it helped me get through a dark time in my life, but at the same time, I really, like, resented that it took so much time, and also I had to, like, admit to my friends I was doing something that 12-year-olds also do, you know? So, um, and, and so this kind of love-hate, ambivalent thing, I, I felt like it was good, it was good fodder to treat in fiction. I'd never seen fiction do this to a video game before, so I'm like, well, why not try? So I threw it into the book. I didn't know how it would be relevant, but I, I put it into the book, and I was like, well, let's see if, if I can connect this in some way. At the same time, I leave New York, I move to Florida. I, 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 li I live in Naples, Florida, which is this cozy little beach community on the Gulf of Mexico. And I went there to teach. Uh, I got a job teaching at Florida Gulf Coast University. And so um, uh, for a long time, I did this for about 10 years, for a long time, I thought of myself more as a teacher than a writer. And, uh, and, and I would, I, you know, I kind of threw myself into teaching. And I kept on having these experiences with students that were really shocking to me. Um, a good, uh, I'll, I'll tell you two, two quick stories. Um, the first one, uh, I, it was my first semester teaching, and I, I taught first year writing classes, composition one. And I go into my first class to teach, and there's 25 students in the room, and I teach my class, and I go home, and, uh, and I come back like two days later for the second class, and of the 25 students, 21 still remain. Um, uh, and this happens, like they shop around and like take, you know, add, uh, drop an ad and so forth. Um, and, uh, and so of the four people who dropped the class, three of them, Eventually their names fell off of my online role, but one name stayed, and I kept on waiting for this name to leave. I, I kept on waiting for her to drop the class, and she just never did. And I, eventually I just kind of forgot about it, um, and I taught my class, and it's the end of the semester. It's the last class before finals week, uh, and I walk in to teach, and there's this new person in the back of the room. I was like, hi, who are you? And she says this name. It's the name from the role, and she hasn't been there since day one. And I'm like, "Welcome back!" And you know, and uh, and 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 I teach my class, and she comes up to me at the end of class, and she says, and this is a, a quote, I swear to God, she says, "So I think I've fallen a little behind in your class." <laughs> what extra credit can I do to get a good grade? I mean, not to pass, but like to get a good grade. I was like, well, there's, there's not, there's, there's not enough extra credit. Like you've missed literally the entire semester. Like you, you've missed, you've missed every single assignment. Like there's, and she's like, I, seriously? And she was really upset about this. She's like, you're going to fail me. I'm like, well, it's not, wasn't my choice. Like you, you just didn't do any of the work. And she's, and she's like, you know, um, and I, t I told her that that the school had this like really generous thing uh, policy. Like she just ta retakes the class next semester, and whatever whatever grade she gets will replace the F, and so it will not even be on her transcript or a GPA. No problem. And she's like, she wasn't satisfied with that, and kind of leaves really angry. And then like on a hunch, like two days later, I check this website, RateMyProfessors.com. I don't know if you know this website, it's like Yelp for teachers, it's terrible. And sure enough, there was a brand new review of me posted anonymously that said, I asked this guy for help and he refused to help me. He's a jackass. I'm like, oh, okay, welcome to teaching. Um, and, uh, and the other story that, that kind of, that's, that was sort of typical, um, uh, I had a student who turned in a paper and I, I discovered very quickly that it was it was it was plagiarized. It was like all copied and pasted from this one, from this website. Um, and so I asked her to come to my office, and she came to my office. And I was like, "Listen, like this is this paper. Here's your paper, and here's the website where it came from. Can you please explain this?" And she looked at me, and she's like, "I don't know. It's weird." <laughs> I said, like, "What do you mean weird?" She's like, "I don't know. It's just." weird I'm like is it like is it a coincidence like did you accidentally type exactly what was on this website she's like I don't know it's just weird and my dad's a lawyer <laughs> like, all right um, so yeah I, I and and so I kept on having these kinds of experiences I kept on just I couldn't figure out like what is going on with with my students and I should say like most most college students are you know wonderful hardworking people but I had enough enough of these types of experiences and my colleagues in the profession had enough of these types of experiences that it felt like a trend like it felt like something weird was going on um, and uh, 
and I, I, I couldn't quite figure it out, um, and so I started writing about it. Because again, I, I tend to like to write about something that I'm confused about. Uh, and so this, this character appeared in the novel one day, Laura Potsdam, if you've read the book, uh, and uh, she became the embodiment of all of these students. Um, and then like you do, almost like you do in real life, you know, you, you, you meet someone, you have a first impression of them, and then you interrogate that first impression over and over and over and over again as you get to know them. And as I got to know Laura, and as I got to know my, my own real life students, I began to realize what was maybe going on, um, which is that they, um, they, they, they came to college in a different environment than I came to college. And, you know, they grew up during a recession. They grew up during tight times, you know. And, uh, and, and they had been given advice by, you know, people that, that were, were, were well-meaning and loved them, but, uh, but um, maybe bad advice about, uh, you know, the purpose of college is just to secure yourself a job. It's a tight, you know, um, brutal economy, uh, and, uh, and so you don't have time for things like writing and poetry. Like, go out and get something that's just job training for something that will pay you well, uh, because it's a global economy and you don't want to be left behind. Um, and so they kind of came to college thinking, okay, I just need to get that slip of paper and get out of here. I need to get that credential. And then they, they would meet people like me who believe in like antique ideas, like a well-rounded education, you know? Um, and, uh, and we're just like two discursive ships passing in the night. And so these kinds of interactions seem sort of inevitable. I know that they felt an enormous pressure to do well in college. I know when I was in college and I just didn't work very hard um, uh, for a semester and I might get a C in a class, I would just kind of take it on the chin and move on. You know? Okay, no big deal. Pretty confident that I would get a job when I graduated. My students had no such feeling. You know, they could not get a C. And whether it was between getting a C, getting a C or getting an A and cheating, getting an A and cheating was was better. You know, and they would try to they would do it all the time. And uh, uh, and 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 they were not guaranteed a job out of college. Most of them were just hoping for an unpaid internship for a couple years to try to get the experience to get an actual job. So it was a very very different time. Um, uh, and so my own, I don't know, uh, it was, it, part of the problem was my own kind of lack of empathy for them. Um, and hopefully that shows, that shows up in Laura too. Um, uh, so I, yeah, so I put it in the book. I didn't know how it connected to everything else, but I put it in the book. And the, and the last thing I'll talk about is, is, uh, is the, the theme of the, uh, the, the kind of maybe big primary theme in the book is a maternal abandonment. The, the main character, Faye, um, leaves the other main character, Samuel, her son, when he's 11 years old, and he doesn't see her again for about 20 years. Um, and this has led many, many people to ask me about my own mother. Uh, <laughs> like imagine like explaining to like a reporter from the New York Times, like no, my mom did not, I, I, I probably gone on too long before mentioning this. My mom has almost contractually made me uh, at every public uh, uh, event tell everybody, no, my mom has never abandoned the family. She's never abandoned anyone. She's a very sweet, loving, wonderful por person who likes the book a lot. Um, but. <laughs> Um, but she didn't know what I was working on for the longest time. Uh, and, uh, and finally, when the book was bought, uh, she's like, so what's your book about? And I, was, I said, um, well, uh, it's about a bad mother. <laughs> and there's this like, long pause on the phone. She's in the sigh. She's like, oh, you know what people are going to think. I'm like, I'm sorry. So um, yeah, no, my mom's wonderful. Um, but but uh, uh, I was never abandoned, but uh, growing up, um, we did move around a lot. My dad was in retail, uh, and uh, and he took every promotion that was offered to him, from um, from the you know sales floor and sporting goods to the sales floor in some other department to you know then assistant manager to a manager to regional manager. Every every uh, every every opportunity that came along, he said yes to because he was trying to he was trying to build a build a career to send three kids to college. Uh, uh, but every one of these, um, every one of these moves, uh, or every one of these promotions involved a move. Uh, and so we moved around in Iowa several times, moved to Illinois, to Missouri, to Oklahoma, to Kansas, and that was all before ninth grade. So every two years I would be the new kid in school. And if you've ever been the new kid in school, you know how brutal that can be, um, how kind of isolating and lonely that can feel. So that's what I gave to Samuel, the abandoned kid, like this kind of sense of isolation and loneliness, you know, um, that I felt um, in those moments. So, so then, you know, so you have all these things in play and you're like, well, how do they all connect? And I realized maybe six or seven years into the process, I realized that they all connected because they're all ways where first, people have sort of walled themselves off in their, in their own world, and second, ways in which people have lost the ability to communicate with people outside of that world. 
So it's, it's, I think this is true for people who are, certain people who are totally committed to political ideologies, to gamers, to people obsessed with their social image uh, uh, status, um, to uh, people obsessed with their devices, or even people in relationships who for one reason or another grow apart, um, stop communicating, and suddenly seem like strangers to each other. So I realized that this was a novel actually about isolation, about disconnection, about living in a bubble of your own mind's uh, creation. So I realized this wasn't actually a protest novel, but rather the protest stuff was just a, a kind of backdrop for what was actually happening with my characters, that it was more like a baseline um, instead of the melody. And that's why revision is so important, because then, after nine years of doing this, I got to go back and make it seem like I intended to do that all along. <laughs> and so the neat thing that happens is about this, you know, this far into the process, suddenly you begin to understand what you're doing, and you get to be intentional, where before you were maybe instinctive. Um, so if this is a, a novel about our inability to see each other or listen to each other, how do I capture that on a smaller scale, on a human scale? It'd be pretty boring if I just wrote about kind of Democrats and Republicans fighting. How can I make that personal? Um, so I wanted just to read you the prologue from, uh, from the novel, um, and with these ideas in mind about how people can kind of grow to live inside their own heads, their own private worlds, and how even people who live together can be total mysteries to each other. If Samuel had known his mother was leaving, he might have paid more attention. He might have listened more carefully to her, observed her more closely, written certain crucial things down. Maybe he could have acted differently, spoken differently, been a different person. Maybe he could have been a child worth sticking around for, but Samuel did not know his mother was leaving. He did not know she had been leaving for many months now, in secret and in pieces. She had been removing items from the house one by one, a single dress from her closet, then a lone photo from the album, a fork from the silverware drawer, a quilt from under the bed. Every week she took something new, a sweater, a pair of shoes, a Christmas ornament, a book, Slowly, her presence in the house grew thinner. She'd been at it almost a year when Samuel and his father began to sense something, a sort of instability, a puzzling and disturbing and sometimes even sinister feeling of depletion. It struck them at odd moments. They looked at the bookshelf and thought, don't we own more books than that? They walked by the china cabinet and felt sure something was missing, but what? They could not give it a name, this impression that life's details were being reorganized. They didn't understand that the reason they were no longer eating crock-pot meals was that the crock-pot was no longer in the house. If the bookshelf seemed bare, it was because she had pruned it of its poetry. If the china cabinet seemed a little vacant, it was because two plates, two bowls, and a teapot had been lifted from the collection. They were being burglarized at a very slow pace. Didn't there used to be more photos on that wall? Samuel's father said, standing at the foot of the stairs, squinting. Didn't we have that picture from the Grand Canyon up there? No, Samuel's mother said, we put that picture away. We did? I don't remember that. It was your decision. It was, he said, befuddled. He thought he was losing his mind. Years later, in a high school biology class, Samuel heard a story about a certain kind of African turtle that swam across the ocean to lay its eggs in South America. Scientists could find no reason for the enormous trip. Why did the turtles do it? The leading theory was that they began doing it eons ago when South America and Africa were still locked together. Back then, only a river might have separated the continents and the turtles laid their eggs on the river's far bank. But then the continents began drifting apart and the river widened by about an inch per year, which would have been invisible to the turtles. So they kept going to the same spot, the far bank of the river, each generation swimming a tiny bit farther than the last one. And after a hundred million years of this, the river had become an ocean, and yet the turtles never noticed. This, Samuel decided, was the manner of his mother's departure. This was how she moved away, imperceptibly, slowly, bit by bit. She whittled down her life until the only thing left to remove was herself. On the day she disappeared, she left the house with a single suitcase. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. 
I would be happy to answer any questions. I think we have about 10 minutes to go. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I think there are two mics, one there and one there, if you have something you want to talk about. Hi. Hi there. I loved your book. I think I read it in one night. <laughs> wow. It was that good. It's a long book. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And I just want to ask if you have any connection to Norway and why the Norwegian folk stories. Yeah, thank you. Um, the Nix of the title is a, is a story from uh, Norwegian folklore. Uh, a Nix also has many different names depending on where you are. It's called a Nix or a, or, or a Nokken, um, a, a Neck or a Nixie. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it comes from Norwegian folklore. And uh, my mother's family uh, came here from Norway uh, several generations ago. Uh, they uh, they moved to, first to a small town in, in Minnesota, and then uh, and then after a time uh, moved to um, eastern Iowa, uh, to a town on the banks of the Mississippi River, um, and that's where most of my family still lives, um, farmers, uh, and. Uh, we didn't know anything about the family back in Norway. Like it all got, it, 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 as soon as, as soon as I think it was my great, great grandfather um, uh, came over, all ties were severed. But my mom remembers her grandmother saying that he came from Hammerfest, <clears throat> which didn't mean anything to me until I finally Googled it and found it was the northernmost city in the world. I'm just like, that's amazing, you know? Um, and uh, no wonder he found Minnesota familiar, you know, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so when I started writing in the, in the, the Knicks, I, I had this character, uh, Faye's father, who immigrates from, uh, from, from Norway, and it was sort of an opportunity for me to, to give myself a family history that I didn't know, it, you know, that we don't know, uh, um, uh, to fill in some blanks, I guess I should say, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, Hammerfest has this extraordinary history, especially what happened to it after World War II, um, is, is just amazing, and so I decided to kind of use a, a lot of that information, and of course the folk tales that, that have always kind of stuck with me me because I know they're, they're, they're part of my own history. Yeah, thank you. Hi there. Hi. Uh, I also really enjoyed your book, thank and you. um, one of the many things that struck me about it was you have this one chapter where there's kind of a regular sentence, and then the rest of the chapter is all one sentence. Yeah. And it, believe it or not, you know, it really, it works beautifully, but I'm curious about that. I'm curious, like, was it always like that one sentence, or were you were you showing off, or were you ever accused of showing off? Or oh yeah, just talk about <laughs> it's an amazing sentence. Yeah, it's just like look what look what I can do. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> um, thanks. I'm glad it worked. Uh, I uh, so yeah, it's it's a chapter late in the book, and um, there's a character in the book. You never know his real name. You only know his avatar's name, his video game avatar, uh, which is Ponage. Uh, and Ponage is hopelessly, recklessly addicted to this video game called World of Elfscape, which is really just World of Warcraft. But I didn't want to be beholden to Warcraft fans who are very knowledgeable on this subject. Uh, so I made up my own video game. And um, for certain reasons, he has decided he needs to quit. Uh, this video game, um, but but like I was talking about earlier, you know, like uh, uh, in some ways, like when you're when you're really into these games, there's a sense of uh, your your sense of what self-esteem, your sense of of meaning in the world can be can be constructed or, or maybe I should say fulfilled by 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 a game. And so um, he's a guy whose relationship is in shambles, whose job is in shambles. Um, nothing's going right for him except being an epic player at this game. And then I'm like, what is going to happen when he decides to give up his one outlet for like meaning and creativity? Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I was writing it and um, I was writing in a notebook, and, and the, first, the first sentence in this chapter is, today was the day he was going to give up video games. And then I started listing when I was writing it, like the first draft, I'd do everything handwritten. I was just, I was just doing a list, like kind of bullets, and I just tried to, tried to think of every excuse in the book as to why he could not possibly give up video games, every excuse that he would give himself, every way to justify this behavior. Um, and I was reading it to my wife, uh, and it was in no syntactic order or anything. I was, it was just a list. And eventually she was like, is this all one sentence? And I, I was like, no, it's, no, it's a, it's a list. But that kind of stuck with me. And I'm like, I, maybe I could do it as one sentence. And I got to thinking like, oh my God, like if there's a, if there's a way I could embody this, his sense of, um, of the world coming, kind of closing down around him, his sense of claustrophobia, his sense of terror at what he's about to do, um, maybe if I, if, I could do that syntactically and just make this huge edifice of a sentence, this 10-page sentence, grammatically correct, <laughs> the 
this 10-page sentence, uh, and, and maybe the reader would feel the kind of anxiety um, uh, uh, that, 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 that my, my character was feeling. So I thought there was an emotional, kind of character-driven reason to do it, so I did it. And that's when I needed, for the first time ever in my writing career, a spreadsheet. <laughs> because I had to like figure out, like I was nesting clauses within clauses within clauses to try to make all of this work out, and um, and so yeah, it took it took a long time to to do it, but um, but yeah, it and I and I, I was certain that uh, a uh, an, uh, an editor or a publisher would want me to cut it, but then my 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 editor said it was actually his favorite chapter in the book. He called it the guitar solo from Bohemian Rhapsody. I was like, <laughs> awesome. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, I think we have time for one more. Hi. Um, so a lot of your characters seem to have an undiagnosed social anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I don't really have a question. What does that mean to you? Why are so many of your characters so anxious about being around other people? You don't know this. This is all terrifying me right now. <laughs> no. Um, like I, like I was talking about earlier, like when, uh, you know, when you realize that you're writing a book about isolation, about disconnection, you start looking for, re for, for ways to do that. Um, and uh, and I'm, you know, I, I don't have any kind of social anxiety disorder, but I'm nervous around new people. I want to make a good impression. I'm an introvert. And so like you kind of use those things you know, and kind of push them a little bit or a lot in, in some cases. Right? Um, so, so yeah, you, 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 I guess I, you, 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 take the, you take the parts of yourself um, and especially the moments when you felt this the most, like when I'm trying to impress someone that's, who's really important, you know, um, uh, I don't know, a woman that I'm interested in or, a, or, a, or I don't know, a boss that I, I want a job from or something, you know, um, you take how weird you feel in those moments and then you just, you, you, and then you, you kind of wrap that around the character. What if that character felt that emotion all of the time, you know? Um, I, I thought it was just a, a way to kind of amp up the, uh, the, the theme of the book, this sense of like growing isolation, this growing disconnection. And I was hoping that with the video games and the social, uh, social anxiety um, and uh, the, the cell phones and the politics, all of these things would kind of Voltron together into, uh, into, into a book that, uh, that hopefully kind of made sense. And even though uh, these things aren't kind of logically tied together, they're emotionally tied together. And so you would feel this thing coming at you from, var from various different vectors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.